Good morning and welcome to worship this beautiful Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday morning. My name is Matt. I'm the pastor at Faith Community Fellowship Church here in Mount Vernon. A special welcome to all of you, especially if you were a guest with us this morning. If you don't normally worship with us, we are so glad that, that you are here wherever it is that you are. We're glad that, uh, that you're joining us this morning for worship. You know, this is my first Easter in Mount Vernon, my first Easter at this church. And this is not the way, frankly, that I thought that it was going to go. In fact, uh, even when this pandemic broke out, there was something in me that was hoping that maybe by today we would be able to uh, to get together. But it, it was obvious several weeks ago that that was not going to happen. We oftentimes think of Easter as uh, in terms of those big celebrations, the big worship celebration. Oftentimes it's, it's the biggest worship service of the year. It's a gathering for, for believers and family and friends. And, and all of those things play into the way that we think and feel about Easter. And this year, it's not happening that way. And this year I'm reminded now in new ways that the story of the first Easter was not a story of pulling out all of the stops for the people to gather together and worship and joy. The story of the first Easter is the story of the angels making, uh, making announcements to the women. It's the story of Jesus appearing to individuals and small groups of people. And before Jesus shows up and before the angels show up, the, the context is always one of fear of doubt, and of isolation. And Jesus appears into those and speaks into those, and he brings new life into the whole world. And so today, as we celebrate Easter in our various places, uh, let's not spend too much time mourning the fact that we are not together. Instead, let's spend our time celebrating that Christ is risen and his spirit dwells in us. And everything that brings joy to Easter at the heart of it, is present and available for us today. As we gather together in worship, the church through the ages has oftentimes uh, repeated this refrain, He is risen. He is risen indeed. He has risen. He, he has, has risen, risen indeed. He is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Jesus, Jesus is, is risen. risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. He is risen indeed. That is what we celebrate this morning. And so as we continue on now in our uh, celebration, uh, let's join our hearts together in song and in praise and in prayer, because our Lord is alive. Oh, oh, oh. 
Good morning and happy Resurrection Day. Let's pray. Almighty God, who through your Son overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that we who celebrate our Lord's Resurrection may arise from the death of our sin through the renewal of your Holy Spirit and may hear and obey your living word of truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.
Our confession of faith this morning comes from the Gospel of John, as well as the Epistle of 1 John. And as I read the words, follow along on the top left of your screen. And the words that are in bold, that are in bold, are for you to, to also say. So let's begin. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And, and the, the Word, word was, was God. God. He was with God in the beginning. Jesus, Jesus is, is God. God. Through him all things were made. Jesus, Jesus is, is God. God. He, he gives life. life. In him was life. Jesus, Jesus is, is God. God. He, he is the life. life. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. Jesus is human. John testifies, we have heard him, we have seen him, we have looked at him, and our hands have touched him. Jesus is real. Jesus is the Christ. He, the life, appeared. We have seen him and testify to him, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. Let's join our hearts together in a word of prayer. Let's pray. O oh, holy God, beyond our imagining, and yet as near to us uh, as our flesh and our smartphones, we come to you this Easter in gratitude. Lord, we confess that we like to think of Easter oftentimes in terms of uh, bright, sunny spring days, uh, full of light and sweetness, full of fellowship with believers and the gathering of friends and family. And today we are reminded in stark ways that, that all of those things are not the heart of what we celebrate today. Uh, today we celebrate resurrection in a world that is consumed by thoughts of pandemic, of sickness, and of death. And Lord, we also remember that since the time of Christ, uh, Easter has seen every kind of war and famine and plague, recession, depression, and persecution imaginable. Uh, and yet, Resur the resurrection of Christ outshines and outlasts every single one of them. So we remember on this day that there are still so many parts of your creation that are, uh, that are stuck in the, in the dark winter of sin and of evil. Those who first witnessed your son's resurrection found it to be a fearful and a fearsome event uh, because you, the great God of surprises, crashed into our reality with something new and unexpected. But on this morning, uh, we don't want to forget that all of this victory comes only after uh, uh, the tragedy of suffering and sacrifice. Lord, we, we think of the events that we celebrated on Thursday and Friday, the, the arrest and the trial, the suffering, the crucifixion of Jesus. And without that sacrifice, Lord, we know that the victory of Easter uh, could not have taken place. And so we don't forget that because the, the clash between your kingdom and the kingdom of this world uh, was grim and remains uh, steadfast. So, Lord, today we do praise you for all the might, the power, and the creativity by which you won the victory <clears throat> for us. And we praise you for raising from the dead our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the great shepherd uh, of all of us sheep who follow him now. But Lord, we do this remembering all of those who are still suffering in so many ways, uh, who are crushed by a, a cruel world uh, to the extent that it's hard for them to uh, even see or perceive uh, the resurrection of Easter and the new life that you bring. So this morning we pray for refugees. We pray for tortured prisoners. We pray for 
uh, uh, innocent victims of war. We pray for abused children and for battered women, for uh, for families who have lost a loved one without a trace or without even a note. Lord, we pray for the homeless poor. We pray for those who are either victimized or have been diminished by by racism or discrimination or oppression of any kind. Uh, we pray for those who who can't see any Easter light this morning because uh, the dark veil of depression has settled in such a way that it doesn't seem that it will lift or who experience chronic pain that won't go away. Those who are experiencing uh, loss of job or loss of income right now with no particular end in sight. Lord, all these things that led Jesus to the cross, the brokenness and sin in the world still exists today. And so the need for resurrection remains so stubbornly present in all of our lives. Make us, uh, Lord God, make us into life-giving spirits to minister to those who need this Easter Sunday um, more than anything, now and always. And Lord, we ask that you would be with us as we're gathered in all these various places virtually to worship. And we thank you for the technology that, uh, that comes as a gift to us to be able to gather together when disease keeps us separated. Lord, above all, we thank you for the presence of the Spirit of the living Lord Jesus Christ. And as, as we encounter nothing short of your very self here this morning in our worship, may we know for sure that indeed we have been in, the, in your sacred presence and may this in turn embolden us to live Easter lives now and always. Uh, help us to take what we experience and learn here and allow it to set a holy tone in our lives um, in every time and in every place. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All week we've been following the life of Jesus as, as it's recorded for us in the Gospel of Luke. And now this morning we get to the, the account of the very first Easter, which is recorded in Luke 24. I'm going to read the opening part of that, and I'm going to back up just two verses so that we can get the context of uh, the women seeing Jesus' death, and then also where he was laid, and then observing the Sabbath, which for the Jews was Saturday. So, Hear the word of the Lord from Luke 24. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it, and that's Jesus' body. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in white clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living? among the dead. He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and then on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them, who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. We give thanks to God for the gift of his word. This is indeed the story of his grace. Jesus was crucified on a Friday. These women watched it. They heard the Roman guard declare that Jesus was dead. Testimony from a professional executioner who knew dead when he saw dead. 
And then the women saw Jesus' body placed in the tomb. They were eyewitnesses to the whole thing. Saturday, they didn't go out. It was Sabbath. But Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, they head for the tomb to mourn and to anoint the body. And all they expect to find there is a dead body. So there's no hope for them this morning. Just duty mixed with love, mixed with despair. And then even those are, are interrupted by an unwelcome surprise, not the way they expect to find things. They get to the tomb and it's already open. The stone is rolled away, which takes care of one of the things that needed to happen for them. But when they go in, Jesus' body is gone. Who could have done such a thing? Their first Easter Im impression must have been just insult added to the injury they were already experiencing. And we read that they're left wondering. Other translations say that they're perplexed or puzzled. So as Easter begins, these women are at a loss. And confusion then quickly turns to fear when two angels show up. And angels usually open with what line? Do not be afraid. And I'm surprised that these two don't because the women are afraid, but their opening line is a showstopper. Why do you look for the living among the dead? And that's exactly the problem. The women are looking for a dead Jesus. They're looking for merely what they expect to find, forgetting what God had promised to do. They expect less than what God does, so they're looking in the wrong place for the wrong thing. And I think it's worth pausing here in the text because there's still a danger for us that we're going to look for the living Jesus among the dead. I'll give, um, I'll give three examples of how this might play out, and maybe these will spark your imagination and you will come up with more. The first way that I think we look for Jesus, people look for the living Jesus among the dead, is to look for Jesus merely in history or in legend. I'll give you an example. Do you remember several years ago when the Da Vinci Code came out? Uh, it sparked a whole lot of new interest in Jesus and his life and what may have happened. And I can name specific people in my life who look for Jesus like this. They get very excited about the latest article that they read or the latest theory that they saw that has uh, something of some new speculation about Jesus, which admittedly is almost always some old speculation about Jesus that had been debunked long ago. But for the most part, uh, these are people who love the idea of Jesus, and so they always want to explore ideas about Jesus. But that Jesus, that Jesus, is mainly myth, and he exists uh, only in the past. They're looking for the living among the dead. A second way I think that this can happen uh, around us is to have even people who know the Bible and who hold it as their only authority for knowing Jesus, but then to look for Jesus only in his teaching and in his example. Look, look at how many religions there are in the world and how many of them are based on the teachings of a dead person. If we reduce Christianity merely to a set of teachings or ideas that we can simply follow, then we put Jesus back in the realm of the dead. Christianity is not simply another religion that's based on what we do in order to follow God. Christian, Christianity is fundamentally a, a relationship with the living Jesus in which God changes us from the inside out. God's work in our lives. But there's a third way that we look for Jesus, uh, the, the living Jesus among the dead. And I think that this is maybe one of the most subtle ways that this happens for us. We become like those women on the first Easter in that <clears throat> we face a lot of what I'll call tomb experiences in our life. It might be relationships or situations at school or work or home or 
or sin or addiction in our own hearts where the situation is not actually a dead end situation, not, not like an actual dead end tomb, but there are things that slowly suck the life and the hope out of us. I think that the pandemic that we're experiencing right now is magnifying those situations for many people. Strained family relationships now are hitting the breaking point for some folks. Or financial situations that, that look like the Titanic on their way down. This is happening for people who uh, had things going well, but now there's a sudden turn and the uh, what felt like a good foundation is suddenly taken away. But for others who are already living on the edge, this is just the, uh, the thing that sucks, sucks them down. But it also can happen with struggles with addiction uh, that are magnified by isolation. And then, of course, in the whole pandemic, the sickness itself and the fear of death. Um, these are situations where, where we, f we feel that we know what the outcome is going to be because our experience tells us that the outcome, what it's likely to be, and, and it's not good. We don't expect God to surprise us, and maybe we suppress hope in order to guard our hearts. Uh, the heart that never hopes never hurts, we think. But in reality, the heart that never hopes perpetually hurts. The problem ultimately with this third, this third area is that we think that whatever we're facing is bigger or more real than the risen Jesus. And as a result, our, our prayers lack hope and our lives lack vision. So we, we want to look for Jesus. We want him to show up in whatever it is that we're facing, but we don't expect to see him alive. And so without even really thinking, we, we shift to the default setting of looking for the living among the dead. And on that very first Easter, that's the situation the women were in. But they were actually literally looking for the dead body of what they didn't know was the living Jesus. So the angels ask them this diagnostic question. Why do you look for the living among the dead? And without even waiting for an answer, the angels give words of truth that catch this words of truth that are the irreplaceable foundation of the Christian faith. He is not here, but rather he has risen. <laughs> he has risen. He has risen indeed. That's where we get that cry from for, the, for Easter. Jesus is not found in the category of historical figures. He is in current events. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. It's a diagnostic question followed by a statement of truth. And then now comes the command from the angels to the women. And if you don't remember it, what, what would you guess the command would be at this point? Uh, repent, believe, go, tell. Those are all great commands. But the angels don't give any one of those. The text says, he is not here. He has risen. Remember. And that's the command. The command to the women is to remember. They say, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words, the text says. Now, all four gospel writers tell us that Jesus explained his death and his resurrection before it happened, but his followers just didn't get it. They couldn't get it. When here at the empty tomb, these women have an Easter aha moment. They remembered. And by their actions, we can tell that they also believed. That's part of biblical remembering. <laughs> remembering has... Uh, not only the bringing something to mind, but to believe it and to act on it. That's part of remembering. And 
This would be a great story, Easter story, if suddenly now all of Jesus' followers remembered and believed. But the Easter story isn't over in Luke 24. It's just getting started. These women go and they tell the 11 disciples and the others what they've just seen and heard. But the others don't believe it. Luke says, uh, he said, I remember the text, their words seemed like nonsense to them. And our default is to believe that death has the final word. And that's understandable. It's nice to know we're not the only ones who can be so dense about this. At least Peter, right, the Peter, the head of the disciples, he runs over to the tomb. But for him, even seeing isn't believing. They still don't remember, understand, and believe Jesus' words. There are, uh, there are two more Easter scenes in Luke 24, and I'd encourage you to read those uh, the, the rest of that chapter today. Literally, it only will take you a few minutes. And both of those next Easter scenes follow the pattern of the account that we're looking at now, except it's actually Jesus, the risen Jesus, who appears to those people instead of angels. But in each of these, uh, in each of these three scenes, there's confusion that turns to fear, and then there's a rebuke, and then there's a lesson, and it's followed by joyful sharing the good news, just like the women did. And the focus of each Easter encounter, every one of these in the Gospel of Luke, is remembering remembering what the scriptures had said about Christ. And not just the stories we have about Jesus himself, but the scriptures from the very beginning of the Old Testament all the way through that time. Luke's makes it uh, really clear that the miracle of Easter is not only Jesus rising from the dead, which of course is the central event of Easter, but also his followers remembering and believing Jesus' promises. And not only Jesus' promises during his ministry, but all of the promises God has made in his word from beginning to end. And the last chapter of Luke reminds me of the first chapter of Luke, where another angel is telling Mary that uh, not only that she, being a, a virgin, will become pregnant and bear a child who is the son of God, but also that her old and infertile cousin Elizabeth is already pregnant. And it brings me to those words in Luke 1 37. The angel says, for no word from God will ever fail. Literally, for every word from God will never be powerless. There's never a single word from the Lord that lacks power. No word from God will ever fail. And Mary responds then to the angel, may your words be fulfilled to me. That's, that's the best way to respond to God. Belief and anticipation of fulfillment. So the action of Easter is that Jesus rose from the dead, never to die again. And then the call of Easter is to remember and believe everything God promises uh, this means for us, that the resurrection means for us. So, so we now move forward, living in the light of Easter today and, uh, and in light of the living Jesus. And so I'd like to, us to remember three ways that Jesus' resurrection at Easter shapes our lives. These are the promises that God records for us in the Bible. And it's certainly not an exhaustive list, but it's going to give us a good start. First, remember, because Jesus rose to new life, we have forgiveness and resurrection victory over sin. We just read those words in Luke 24, 36. Uh, the angel said it. This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. And the Apostle Paul echoes this in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 3 and 4. 
uh, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. So, first of all, let's remember and believe that in Christ, God, give, uh, God forgives our sins and he frees us from the power of sin. A second thing to remember, because Jesus rose to new life with a body that, that never died again, and keep this in mind when you're thinking about Easter, Jesus is the only person in history to rise from the dead and, and return with a body that will never die again. And because Jesus rose into a body that will never die again, we one day too, when Jesus returns, will be raised with a body that will never die again. Uh, that's, that will be our resurrection body. Except, of course, if Jesus returns while we are still alive, in which case we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye to immortality. But uh, the Apostle Paul, he talks about this. He gives this promise to us in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all be changed. Uh, no, no. He said, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? So the command is to remember and believe that in Christ, God promises that death does not have the final word. We look forward to a resurrection like Jesus' resurrection. And a third Easter way that we can remember is this. <laughs> remember that if Jesus can fulfill even his promise to rise from the dead, we can be sure that, uh, that the promise of Luke 1.37 is true, that no word from God will ever fail. So I want to encourage you to remember this if you're facing some tomb situation in life, anything that looks like a dead end or with no options on the horizon. Remember God's promises. John 10 verse 10, Jesus says, The thief comes only to kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus Jesus came so that you may have true life filled with meaning and filled with blessing. And Jesus knows that uh, there's no way to sugarcoat life. He says in John 16, 33, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. When we face trouble in life, it does not mean that God is powerless or uncaring or inattentive. Jesus is more powerful than any trouble we face, and he is with us. And I always love to go to the, that, the go-to promise that's, that's included in the, the description at the very end of the Bible that we read. Uh, in Revelation 21, we read, And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all all things new. And then also he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Write this down so that we can remember and believe. Uh, if you've been walking faithfully with Jesus for a long time and you come to this familiar Easter story, I encourage you, remember and believe and watch Jesus make new areas of your life come alive in unexpected ways. We are never done growing in our faith. But maybe you hear this story as one who knew this truth at one time, but now you're walking on a path that you recognize uh, is a different path. I encourage you, remember and believe what you once knew. 
remember and believe the core of our faith, that Jesus is risen, that he's alive, and that changes everything. Uh, Jesus tells us there's more rejoicing in heaven over the return of the wandering sheep than over the flock who never left. And so be that cause for rejoicing. Remember and believe. Maybe you hear this Easter story this morning, and for you, Christianity is a list of dead rules, of do's and don'ts, of trying to stay on God's good side so that he doesn't get angry, or trying to live up to endless expectations that that are always just, just out of reach. Remember and believe that God loves you. And that God wants to be in a living and a flourishing relationship with you. And that God embraces you, not because you've hit the mark, but because Jesus died and rose again to make all of those religious markers irrelevant. God loves you, and he wants you to experience his love and grace. Remember and believe. Or maybe you hear this Easter story this morning, and you've never experienced God's love and forgiveness. If the Easter story is new to you and hearing about Jesus in this way is new to you, remembering and believing today simply means to remember or or acknowledge the account that you just heard as God's story of love and forgiveness, that it's for you personally. And you respond by saying, I believe. Tell God, I believe. That's what I want. Today is the best day to start a new life of freedom, and of grace. And then I would encourage you to reach out to us so that we can celebrate with you and that we can walk this journey, this new journey with you. Easter means for us that Jesus is not a dead teacher, but rather a living Savior. Christianity is not based on a better moral code for us to follow. Christianity is based on the promises of God to forgive us, to love us, and to give us a hope and a future because Jesus died and rose again for us. And God promises all of this to us as a gift by his grace. So friends, let's not look for the living Jesus among the dead. He has risen. He is alive. Let us remember and believe that Jesus died for us, that on the third day he rose again for us. And now, because of what he has done, we have life in him. Thanks be to God for that indescribable gift. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you created us in your image and you loved us. You created us to be in a special relationship with you. Lord, we know that that relationship was broken because of sin. We thank you that you did not abandon us ever in our rebellion but that you yourself put in place a plan to redeem us, to free us, to make us right with you. And so, Lord, today we celebrate resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, the event that changes everything in the world, the event that gives us new hope and new life. Today, Lord, we celebrate that it is not what we do for you that is so great, but it's what you have done for us and give us as a gift of your grace. So to you, Father, be all glory, honor, and praise through Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen. Let's let our hearts overflow in uh, praise for God, for all he has done for us in song. We begin to respond with singing.
Friends, we have heard God's word. We have sung his praises. We have lifted our voices and our hearts to him. May the joy of Easter and the reality of resurrection sink deeply into your heart and permeate your lives always. And now as we go from wherever it is that you are to continue on uh, through this life in the joy of the resurrection, I ask, I ask you to receive God's blessing and maybe even just hold out your hands in a posture of receiving because the Lord desires to bless you today. And so now receive his blessing. Words from scripture. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and joy to love and serve the Lord.